her parents died and she got a small inheritance from her father, of course. Her brother got the lion's share of the inheritance by virtue of being a man. But she was able to survive at the university on a combination of her inheritance, her natural lack of interest in those things material. Well, I don't know if it was natural, but she certainly ended up with a lack of interest in things material by virtue of, at least of her inability to obtain them. She was also floated the occasional Deutsche Mark for covering for professors. They needed her there. They knew how good she was, and she needed some cash to stay. Then, in 1916, she formulated what would come to be known as Mother's Theorem, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But as she struggled through producing lots of papers, which of course is the thing that professors are expected to do, even now. But she couldn't be a lead author on a, on a publication. So she was a secondary author on many major publications, not the least of which came to be known as Mother's Theorem. And then, in 1919, it came to the faculty, a meeting of the faculty at the University of Göttingen, that they had this brilliant mathematician, and can we grant her a faculty position? It was 1919, which of course, it was just after the armistice of World War I, and this is rather in the center of Germany. Um, in 19, I, I always print this up so I can get the quote just so, in 1919, the history and philosophy faculty in the faculty senate at the University of Göttingen said, what will our soldiers think when they return to the university and find that they are required to learn at the feet of a woman? It's unthinkable. But she did get, again, through the back door, what's called a private docent position which is somewhat below an instructorship in America, somewhat below an adjunct professor position, which means basically that she was kind of a TA, like a graduate student, but she wasn't a graduate student, of course, because she couldn't enroll there anyway if she hadn't already. Anyway, so you get the picture. But it was finally in 1922, she finally got her first academic income. So let us turn now to some of the science. Mother's theorem is most succinctly put like this. For every symmetry, there is a corresponding conservation law. And this is how it works. Rather than develop the formalization and do a bunch of mathematics, I have built a machine. And this is how it works. We take the principle of least action, which I'll describe in a minute, and then a symmetry, and I will define what I mean by symmetry in another minute. We take those, we apply Noether's theorem, do a bunch of math, you know, a couple of pages of, not even, but a page or so of algebra and calculus, and then bingo, out comes a law of nature. Okay, so prior to that, when Newton formulated his three laws of motion, what did he do? Well, he observed things. Things like apples falling from trees and candles flickering and light through lenses and so forth to come up with them very empirically. But now, Emmy Noether provided some mathematical formalism from which, presented with a symmetry, a law of nature could be derived. So something very special is going on in there. And here's a, a copy of the original paper. So the first ingredient to developing the laws of nature is the principle of least action. Now the principle of least action is a fascinating thing. And if it were attributable to one person, then um, I would have an accompanying talk about that one person, but it's not. It started in optics, the observation of the way that light rays travel by Fermat. And then Maupertuis, uh, uh, Another one of the French mathematicians of the 1700s formulated a more general theory, which was then elaborated by Euler, Lagrange. And then finally, Hamilton put it together 
in the fashion that we know today. Basically, it is this. Stuff happens in such a way that a quantity defined as the action is a minimum. And the way I've always explained this very hand-wavingly is that the universe is lazy and it will take the path from point A to point B, whether that is cooling a beer in the fridge or the trajectory of a, of a golf ball or what have you, the trajectory of an electron through a circuit board. Nature is going to do it in the way that is easiest. And by easiest, mathematically, what I mean is that the action is minimized. Now, the action is defined to be the sum of the difference in kinetic energy and potential energy as things happen. So if we take any system and add up the, the difference in kinetic and potential energy, the energy of motion and the energy available to do work, add that up over each incremental step of the system and then postulate all possible steps, the actual process will be that which minimizes this quantity, the action.